Does it really matter how we behave as Christians? Does it really matter how we behave as Christians? Surely if all your sins are forgiven, then you can use that as license to just do as you want. Well, 1 Peter 2 verse 11 certainly tells us it does matter how we behave as Christians. Dear friends, I urge you. He's calling them dear friends and he's urging them. It's really, really important. He cannot stress this enough. Dear friends, as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires. I urge you to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. We're aliens and strangers. We don't really like to be called a stranger, do we? I um, remember when my mother-in-law was thought of as, a, as an outsider, even though she'd been in Bridgend for 20-something years. Um, that's not very nice, is it? Um, because she'd been born and raised in London, in Greater London. Um, you know, when you're amongst those people, that must, that must really hurt, you know? Um, we don't like being called strangers normally, do we? And yet this is actually telling us that we must be like strangers in a particular way. You are aliens and strangers in the world. At one time, we were there with the world. We were in the world. We were outside of Christ. But now, now, we are strangers to the world. So if you are a Christian here today, you are different. I am different. I'm estranged to the world system. And so we must abstain from sinful desires, which it says war against your soul. And this is really interesting. I think this is a bit like friendly fire. Have you ever heard of friendly fire? I looked up a whole list of incidents over uh, the, the 20th century, particularly the late 20th century, of, of friendly fire and how it killed many people over the years. Really sad, where people had mistaken somebody um, and, and basically killed somebody on their own side, facing, fighting for the same side, but, but actually hitting them. Friendly fire. But warring against your soul, if you are doing something from your sinful desires, they war against your soul. So you're actually fighting against yourself. You're fighting against the life that God has put there in you. Effectively, like friendly fire. Ridiculous, isn't it? We mustn't do it because these things war against our souls. Who will you serve? Who will you serve? It's a question that comes up again and again. They accuse you of doing wrong. They will accuse you of doing wrong. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. They will accuse us of doing wrong. I've read so many times of people saying, oh, it's not very Christian, your views on LGBT things and things like that. They would say it's not, it's not God honouring. And I guess I'm led to think of, you know, in Psalm 73, where he says he, he almost envied the arrogant, the, 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 the person who doesn't fear God. And it says their, their tongues, they lay claim to heaven. And, and, the, and they, they also seem to own the earth as well. It's as if they, they possess everything. They lay claim to everything. And yet, of course, they're saying that but they don't truly have a relationship with God. And they're trying to tell us what we should do, even though we have been told how to live our lives here by God in the scriptures. They tell us that our biblical views are wrong. They tell us that we are unloving. They tell us that we are immoral for being uh, pro-life. 
So let us show a watching world what it truly means to love unselfishly. Dear friends, I urge you, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, the finger pointing, the name calling, they may see your good deeds. Ultimately, what you're doing will show itself to be what is good and right. And they will glorify God on the day he visits us. So let us show that watching world what it means to love him selfishly. Love to this modern age is being true to yourself. But love isn't being true to yourself, it's being true to God who made us and who we need to put at the very centre of our lives. And that way everything else is arranged around him. He is at the centre rather than us at the centre. He defines what love is. God is love, we read in the scriptures, don't we? Verse 13 tells us to submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. I think when we fear God properly, when we respect him, we will not fear people's opinions of us. And that's always the, the tussle, that's the struggle. Who will you serve? Who will you respect? Who will you fear? Will you fear God? Will you fear man? Will you fear the Lord? Will you fear people and their opinion of you? If I don't wear this brand of trainers, I'll be thought of as... If I don't do this, if I don't agree with this at work, if I don't... Who are you going to respect? Who are you going to serve? Who are you going to fear? The person who gives God first place in their lives... They won't be rude to others. They won't be uncaring of others. No, it says to do what is right. You see there? It's God's will that by doing God you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. No, live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honour the King. It's often said familiarity breeds contempt. People say you're, you are your real self at home. But of course that just doesn't excuse any bad behaviour. It doesn't say well, when, you get to, when you get home you can treat everyone your nearest and dearest like dirt. It doesn't say that, does it? It's meaning that everybody should be shown love and respect, whether they be at home, whether they be here in the church, um, or anywhere, colleague at work, neighbour, and certainly to honour those in leadership above us. The person who's wrong, caring of others, they actually value them more. As priceless, as unique, as made by God, there's no freedom in God. Well, we're strangers in this world, or strangers to the world. And this next part talks about slavery. Now some people will say, oh, that means that the Bible condones slavery. It doesn't condone it, it just accepts it as part of what was a very large part of the Roman Empire. It ran on many, many slaves, slave power, you could say. And so, of course, many of those slaves were actually Christians as well. So these are people who are owned by others and yet also have the Lord God as their own. And they're given their own personal instructions here in the Word of God. Verse 18 of chapter 2. Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable for a man 
bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and you endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. You think about this. This is people who are owned by others. As I said, owned by the Lord as well, of course, in a, in a voluntary sense. They've given up uh, uh, saying, Lord, I hand you my life. Um, and, and they've got this, this ownership, this double ownership. And, the, and, and instead of resenting anything, never resenting, but rather submitting themselves with all respect. Um, you know, and you think, well, if, if this is how God instructs slaves to behave in the Roman Empire, who we think, frankly, that's an unfair system, how much more should we be willing as employees today, you know, to be in these rules under this kind of setup where God is instructing us to give respect even when people are harsh with us, even when we uh, suffer unjust suffering. It says in verse uh, 21, to this you were called. To this you were called. Does it really matter how we behave as Christians? Yes, it's about being strangers to this world's values. Valuing everyone, but not valuing their values. Letting the Lord write his values upon our hearts. Now we have the ultimate example of servanthood there in, in verse 21. To this you are called because Christ suffered for you. And don't forget, this is still talking ultimately to slaves, but everybody really. But you think about how, how this would have delighted the ear and the mind of the slave reading this and thinking, wow, even the Lord Jesus became like a slave for my sake. And if, in a weird kind of way, Jesus puts himself under the slaves, the lowest of the low, because he was prepared to sacrifice his own life and pay for the sin of the person who was the lowest in the pecking order of that Roman Empire, and of course anybody before or since. And to this you are called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And there it, it quotes from Isaiah. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. He was the perfect man. Perfect man, perfect God, there together. Jesus Christ, he committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. Dead like a uh, lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, he did not open his mouth. When he suffered, he made no threats. Think about that, how quick we are to justify ourselves. But Jesus didn't do anything of the sort. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. In that place of horror, in that place, the cross, Calvary, Golgotha, that place there, it was a place of torment and pain, and yet, in a funny kind of way, it was a place of rest. A place of him resting in the Father's arms, in the Father's plan. Resting there because he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He came from the highest height, from the, the greatest the glory of heaven down to such a world as this in such subjugation, such 
the lowest place. And he did it so willingly. He entrusted himself and a perfect example that we need to entrust ourselves and our future to the Father as well. Giving ourselves to his service. Leaving the outcome with him. He knows everything. The beginning and the end. Does it really matter how we behave as Christians? Yes. Yes, it does. Not only is it about being strangers to this world's values, it's about being his servants. This is one of my favourite verses in the whole Bible. 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself, Jesus himself, bore our sin in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. He himself, nobody else, nobody else, because nobody else could take that punishment. Anybody else would have to die for their own sins and therefore not be able to stand in your stead, on my stead, wouldn't be able to take punishment for anybody else. Only he, and it's he himself who took this. And he bore our sins in his body. He took that. That wrath of God, the anger at our sin in his body. He took it personally on the tree, that is on the cross, on a tree that he made, wood that he made. So that, here's the purpose, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. Our purpose in this, that we might die to sins. And that's really an ongoing process, isn't it? It's not just a one-off. It's not just I come to Christ. Uh, on the day you become a Christian, but also that we might die to sins daily. We need to be repentant, don't we, of those things. Otherwise they creep in, they creep in on us. And we find ourselves defeated again, don't we? So that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. Some people uh, accuse Christians of, oh, it's what, all about what you don't do. You don't do this and you don't do that. What do we do? We're well, going to live for righteousness. That's our positive. We're living for the Lord now. We're living for King Jesus. Living for righteousness. Living for what is right. And it's got this last phrase, by his wounds you have been healed. By his wounds, what he suffered on the cross, you have been healed. Now, some people take this uh, as, a, as something to do with physical healing. That we are physically healed because he himself suffered on the cross. But I believe that is not a correct reading of that. This is to do with our spiritual healing. How we have been brought from death to life. By his wounds, you have been healed. In the way that uh, it talks in Psalm 147 of him, the Lord, binding up our wounds, healing us. This is, this is what he has done. And there's a third picture here. We've talked uh, about first S, strangers, of being strangers. And then being servants of God. Strangers to the world. Servants of God. But now sheep. Sheep. Now, again, we mentioned slavery. Um, and obviously it has a negative thought within most people. And we think about sheep. We go, mm, that's not a very nice thing to say. It's a bit of a put down, isn't it? But we've all got to follow somebody, haven't we? We all follow somebody, whoever we are. You are like sheep going astray. But now, says verse 25, you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So many times Jesus gave illustrations, didn't he? Pictures of people 
who were shepherds and we like sheep. He's bringing rebels to himself, sheep that go off and get into trouble. He's bringing wanderers back to himself, into the safety of his family, into his fold, into his home, into his care. This is what he is in the business of doing. You were like sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You see there the work of the Lord in our lives. The shepherd to lead us. He's someone who, who goes out before us and we follow him. He is the one who we can see what he did. We have this a wonderful record through the Gospels, don't we? You were like sheep going astray. Takes uh, a swallowing of our pride to admit that, doesn't it? That we have gone astray. We haven't done what was right. It's not just a shrug of the shoulders and I'm only human after all. But it's saying we are responsible and we are under God's wrath until we turn to him for repentance, until we reach up and cry out for his rescue, we are those sheep going astray. But now we've returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Glory to him. It's a, it's a glorious thing, isn't it? And in every age here, written to people in the first century, who were going through hard times, hardships, because they were Christians. And today, you know, whenever we have to suffer, Jesus says, you follow me, you follow me, you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Let's not wander, let's not go astray anymore. Let's continue to submit ourselves to every authority, as long as they do not themselves go against the Lord's will. Let's honour the King, but honour King Jesus even more. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you again for your word to us today. We know that uh, we live in some very different days uh, to when this was first written, and yet, Lord, you prepare us. You prepare us for every eventuality. You know, earlier we were praying for those people in Egypt who'd lost their pastor, who'd been stabbed to death. And what a horrific thing that must have been for those 35 young people on that trip to see that. And we pray for them in, in their anguish of seeing of that, that loss. And Lord, we pray that they would still think it worth following the Lord Jesus. This world has nothing for them. In fact, may it drive them to you because they would say, well, if that's what living outside of the Lord is, I don't want any part of it. I want to be in the Lord's fold. I want to be in his family, in his flock. I want to be cared for by the Lord Jesus. I know that I'm safe with him. Father, we pray uh, that we ourselves would know the warmth of your welcome and of your keeping and will follow you as you go out before us as our great shepherd, as our good shepherd. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.